And uh, right now, we're going to dive into the world of seed alfalfa. And uh, it's going to be fascinating because we're going to focus on the war of the weevils and desiccation strategies. You know, uh, yesterday we had an opportunity to uh, talk about the battle uh, against um, uh, things in the, uh, in the pea world. And today we're going to switch it up and go with seed alfalfa. So our next speaker is Trevor Deering. In fact, he's going to be our commander-in-chief for this discussion. As part of the Farming Smarter team, Trevor oversees industry contract projects. He makes sure that clients get solid results by spending most of his time out in the fields, making sure everything happens uh, when it should. He's got his BSc and a Master's in Agriculture Studies and has had uh, some previous work experience with BASF and Ham and Ag Research. So he's going to outline what happened on the war front at Rosemary. He says it was a gruesome battle with many casualties and victory is near, but combating the enemy requires rallying the forces and utilizing chemical warfare. So we look forward to that story now. Here's Trevor. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, awesome, awesome intros. It's really good. Yeah, I don't know, don't know where you got all that information too, but, it, but it's good. good. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, good morning, I guess. Um, this is my first in-person presentation at one of our conferences, um, so I'm very nervous, but uh, but super excited too. It's it's been super fun, and uh, I hope you've also been having fun. And uh, I hope that I can do even just half as good as the 4-H students did, you know, and it'd be as exciting, you know. It's been, it's been really good. I'll be talking about four trials today. Um, so it's a lot to go through, so bear with me. But uh, first I'll start with the most gruesome trial, the war against the alfalfa weevils. Then I will talk about the two desiccation trials and last give an update on the rolling barley trial. Uh, that was in its second year last year. Okay, put on your parachutes as we jump into the war zone. Farming Smarter partnered with the Alfalfa Seed Commission to continue alfalfa weevil trials that they initiated in 2016 lab testing. And to conduct new trials with desiccation products and plant growth regulators that, that Lewis was in charge of. I have framed the language of the alfalfa weevil trial as a war because that's exactly what it felt like, you know, and, and lots of the producers were talking about, you know, how tough it was, and, and it is really a battle against these little buggers. For the past few years, the alfalfa weevil has become increasingly damaging to the seed alfalfa crops, particularly for the growers near Rosemary, Alberta. The weevils have become resistant to the common insecticide, Matador, as demonstrated in 2016 lab experiments. And this has led to an increase in the population that is harder to kill. The larvae eat the flower buds, which produce the seeds. And this can decimate fields, uh, reducing seed yield dramatically. Growers near Rosemary have been looking for alternative insecticides to take back their power, so ferociously stolen by this ruthless enemy. We set up two trials at two locations near, or last year, just south of Rosemary. And they were about one mile apart. The trial consisted of 11 treatments, an untreated check, silencer at normal label rate, a sale and corrigin at half normal and double rates, and entrust unintentionally at a little bit different rates, uh, so half rate and then a couple lower rates. The plots were six meters wide by six meters long, and we used a two meter spray boom. And this allowed for a two meter buffer on either side of the plot. We used sweep nets to collect and count the number of larvae from the two meter sprayed section of each plot. We swept right before we sprayed, then we sprayed, and then we spray, uh, swept four days, seven days, and 11 days after that application. 
We swept and sprayed on June 14th when the larvae were actively hatching. The spray timing was determined through close observation and communication with Brad Alexander with the Alfalfa Seed Commission. Finally, we harvested the plots for yield measurements. We used a linear model with ANOVA statistics and 95% confidence level to assess the data in this trial and all the trials that I'll be talking about today. As mentioned, we swept on the and sprayed on June 14th, uh, zero days after application. Then we swept on June 18th, the 21st, and 25th. We've seen a large population growth and peak around the four days after application, with the assail at normal and double rates being the most effective. After the four days after application, things get a little muddy with the data. Um, and so if we look at the seven days after application, we see a sale at double rate was doing a little worse than the normal rate. Um, and the other products appear to be doing as good or worse than the untreated check. Not really a logical progression. Um, we see some of like the lower application rates doing better than some of the higher application rates. Um, and there might be something else uh, influencing those sweeps. At 11 days after application, we've seen a sale normal and double and all in trust rates having lower larvae counts than the other treatments. We found statistically lower weevil counts at four days after application with a sale double rate having significantly lower weevils than the untreated check and corrigin treatments. Numerically, a sale at normal and double rate and in trust at the half rate showed lower larvae counts than the other treatments. Averaging all the counts over all the timings did not result in any statistical significance um, between the treatments. However, numerically, we see a similar picture to the four days after application with a sale normal and double rates and in trust at half rate showing lower weevil counts. Looking at the yield, there is a large amount of variability, um, and this is tied to the fact that our treatments did not totally control the weevil populations, leading to heavy feeding and variable seed production. Uh, and also the sweeping may have damaged the plots a little bit and added to some of the variability. Um, so that leads to no statistically significant difference between any of the treatments. Numerically, the assail and trust in silencer, silencer treatments have good yield compared to the corrigin and untreated treatments. From the 2017 to 2020 small plot trials conducted by the University of Alberta, they found assail and in trust at label rates or higher uh, to be effective, and that's what they were recommending. And with some of our data, you can kind of see that uh, that's, that's basically what we were seeing as well. A minor use application for a sale was submitted to the PMRA by Ron Pitzgallany of Strategic Vision Consulting. And an application is in the works for Entrust as well. So these two appear to be the special forces that farmers uh, can recruit in the future to combat this, the weevils. The research battle continues this year with the Seed Alfalfa Commission. We will be assessing the treatments to see if there's any that we can add or subtract or change. And we'll be considering possibility of a second application. Uh, in one of the previous studies, they did a second application and they seen that it was helping and it was lowering those populations even more. And we've also talked about maybe adding some tank mixing in um, with, uh, with other chemicals. We are rallying the troops and equipping them with the latest technology to secure a victory. Okay, well, enough with the war talk, you know. We've, we've had a lot of battle talk, and I don't know if that's COVID or what's going on, but we're, we're on the fight. But uh, we'll, we'll switch that up a little bit, and uh, I'll talk about the next two trials, which are the desiccation trials that we had. The first one is a products trial testing LI700 and high activate surfactants with reglone ion and acetic acid. Treatments were sprayed at normal desiccation timing when the crops were at full maturity, so with most of the leaves falling off and, and those seed pods turning brown. 
there were two locations, one just south of Rosemary and the uh, other one um, to the east of Lethbridge on one of Ken's fields. <clears throat> the treatments were sprayed late in the evening when the sun was setting or early in the morning so that the products would have time to absorb into the plants uh, without being activated by the sun's UV rays or before being evaporated. So that's why in these next pictures you're going to see a lot of beautiful sunsets, sunrises, a lot less war. We had six treatments. We had regalone and acetic acid alone and in combination with the surfactants. Regalone, unfortunately, was unintentionally sprayed at 4x rate, resulting in a very tough test for the acetic acid. We were really wanting to see how that acetic acid was, was performing against the regalone. Um, but hold that thought because there is some good news still with that. We used 95% glacial acetic acid and it was mixed in two liter bottles, 20% acetic acid to 80% water and sprayed at 100 li 160 liters per acre water volume. The plots were standard small plots, 2.5 meters wide by 6 meters long and we used the 2 meter spray boom. We sprayed um, or we took photos of each plot and conducted a visual rating of each plot right before harvest. The photos were run through a program to detect green pixels representing green plant parts not completely dried down by the chemicals. And I, I call this a greenness rating. For the visual rating we used a, a 0 to 100% scale to visually assess the ability of each treatment to dry down the plants more brown and dry plants would get a higher percentage. Then we harvested the plots. We sprayed rosemary September 7th and Lethbridge September 24th due to uh, the different stages that were happening at, at each location. Not surprisingly, Reglone showed greater desiccation than acetic acid in the efficacy and greenness ratings. Acetic acid, however, did substantially well compared to the high rate of reglone, giving hope for its potential use. The addition of surfactant products improved the effectiveness of acetic acid, with high activate being slightly better than Ally 700, and had significantly greater visual efficacy uh, than acetic acid alone. Yield data showed no statistical significance Numerically, the averages show both acetic acid and reglone with surfactants yielding slightly better than with no surfactants. And this is good news for acetic acid, like I was saying, because it did yield similar to reglone. Um, yeah, which is good. So we did make it a tough test for acetic acid with the high rate of reglone. And acetic acid appears to have stood up to that test performing comparable to the reglone. Surfactants improved the dry down capability of acetic acid, seen in the visual and photograph ratings. Acetic acid would need to be applied at about 32 liters per acre and at least 80 liters per acre water volume. And when we look at the price that we were able to get the acetic acid at this year, um, from the co-op in Brooks, uh, the price seems to be, um, cost prohibitive for farmers at the moment. Um, so we probably won't be continuing with this product um, from some of the feedback we got from the growers. But um, I mean, it's also on a case-by-case on a -case basis too, right? If, if you were able to get acetic acid at a, a discounted price, um, our data is showing that there is potential use for it, uh, especially for organic farmers. Uh, so this is, this is good news. And we will be working with the commissions to find other options this year um, so that we can continue to equip these seed alfalfa growers to desiccate their product or their crops better. The last trial of the desiccation trials was a desiccation timing. It also is a three-year study testing acetic acid against reglone. We sprayed at three different timings, early, normal, and late, at the same location that the products trials were at. There were seven treatments. 
the early timings were sprayed one week before standard desiccation occurred, um, and that was determined by, again, the maturity of the crop and also when the farmers were, were going to go out. And at, um, at standard desiccation timing, and then one week after the standard desiccation timing. We collected the same data as we did the products trial, but with one addition, we, we tested the germination of the seed back in our shop to see if spraying at a different time had any effect on the germination. All timings show acceptable to very good dry down of the crop. One interesting observation in the field that shows in the greenness graph is the chemicals didn't kill the undergrowth, like the new undergrowth completely. The early and late timings seen more growth under the canopy uh, that was not dried down compared to the standard timing. The early timings were harvested two weeks after spraying, which allowed for extra time for that new growth to occur. And late timings also had much undergrowth uh, at the time of spraying that just weren't able to be dried down by the products. Running a factorial test to compare each product, it was found that late acetic acid was statistically more efficacious than early and standard timings for the acetic acid. All Reglone timings uh, appear to be the same. No statistical significant difference was found in yield between any treatments uh, for, the, yeah, for the yield. On average, the acetic acid may be between zero to half a bushel less in yield than Reglone, which is small and a bit lower than, than the overall variability in the data. So I'm inclined to say there's, there's no difference in yield between the products and timings. But again, this was one site year, and uh, more years could help to corroborate these findings. There was no statistical significant difference in germination between the treatments for Lethbridge. Numerically, however, the early timing was slightly better, which was a late September spraying. So remember, uh, these spraying dates were a little um, staggered between the rosemary and Lethbridge dates. And so similarly, the late September timing for rosemary, which would actually be the, the late desiccation timing, also seen the highest germination. So this late September timing appears to result in slightly better germination. And this may just be a phenol phenological effect, um, but more research too would, would need to be done taken to understand this a little better. So again, acetic acid stood up to the test and performed comparable to the high rate of Reglone. Uh, Reglone was already, was also sprayed at a high rate in this one. The standard spray timing suggests better dry down of crop and undergrowth with late September timing suggesting better germination. With yield and germination, further study is needed to flush out the effects of the chemicals and the timings on the crop. Like the products trial, uh, acetic acid appears to be cost prohibitive. However, this year we are we're going to continue work with the commissions to, to find other products and to continue to understand the, the spray timing in particular. Um, the farmers are really wanting to open up their desiccation window and hopefully spray a little earlier. Um, for multiple reasons there, um, beat some of the weather, um, hopefully the desiccation products work a little better earlier with different weather conditions, so we want to continue to help them and, and support them in that effort. Okay, lastly, we're gonna, we're, we'll give an update on the rolling barley. So this was year number two of the rolling barley study that we conducted with George Lubberts of Complete Agronomic Services. Last year we had larger plots, so they were a two and a half meter by 14 meter plot with a large um, pathway so that we could turn around and get to each plot as we rolled. With the same rolling timings, uh, so we rolled right after, well we had an untreated check, we rolled right after seeding, then we rolled at one, two, three, and four leaf, and then the first node stage. The four leaf timing was rolled a little later than in 2020 being a little closer to the one node stage. Um, and as you, some of you guys may know too, it seemed like some of the crops were growing so super fast this year that some of those timings just ended up really close together, some of those stages. We measured visual leaf disease infection 
plant height, plant counts, silage and grain yield, and silage and grain quality. We found similar results as in 2020 with slightly stronger trends in some of the measurements. This here is just a picture of, of all the first rep plots and where the blue arrow is pointing is plot 107 and that plot was rolled at the one node timing. And you can see there's a definite height change there. And the plot that's just right next to it to the left there, uh, further in the picture, is the four leaf timing, which, which also looks like it's been impacted. And the data supports that as well. You can see that <clears throat> there was a significant difference in the height with the one node being shorter than the rest of the treatments and the four leaf being, being shorter than only a couple of the treatments there. So it seems as though rolling at the one node is defeating the purpose, right? Like, so the purpose of rolling is to push the rocks and debris into the soil so we can lower our chopper header and, and get as much plant material as possible. And in this case, we're actually lowering that, the height of the crop. So kind of self-defeating self there. And in the, oh, this next one here. We counted the plants later than, than in 2020 for the plant count population. Approximately two weeks after the one node rolling. And we found that the one node treatments had statistically less plants per meter squared than all the other treatments, except for the four leaf timing. So some of the plants were, were dying off as a, as a result of the rolling, which is something we, we didn't catch in 2020. And the picture there shows just, just how bent the plants got in that one no timing, and they, they seem to stay bent all the way up until harvest. Um, that's quite interesting. There was a statistically significant reduction in silage yield as well in the one node timing, something we didn't see in 2020, with only a very slight reduction at the four leaf stage. Um, so in 2020, we weren't really seeing any yield impacts, but, but this year, we definitely were. There, and also with the grain yield, same picture. Um, we were seeing statistically, statistically significant reduction in grain yield at the four leaf and one node timings. With the four leaf being less than the earlier stages, and the one node being less than all the other stages. Looking at protein, we found only very small numerical increase in protein at the four leaf and one node, uh, but it wasn't statistically significant. Four leaf stage was statistically lower than untreated to two leaf timings only um, for the grain yield, but it's a very small difference there. Um, so I'm not sure that this is really gonna ever going to impact anything. We also sent this, the silage samples off for feed analysis, which we didn't do in 2020. And looking at uh, the average uh, percent acid digestible fiber, we, found, we find the first leaf stage statistically greater than the untreated and two leaf. Um, this is quite a low difference and uh, still well within feed um, feed analysis and, and, and good levels. Possibly something to keep in mind for future research, um, but doesn't, doesn't appear to be an issue right now. Uh, we also did a thousand kernel weight measurement and we found the four leaf and one node timings to be significantly lighter than the other timings. And the seed grade of the one node timing was, was downgraded slightly on average for all the plots. And this was due to more mildew found in the seed samples. Um, so maybe some, some disease implications coming in there on the, on the first no timing. With these findings, we still recommend, similar to what we were in 2020, um, to roll anywhere from pre-emergence to early four-leaf stages, being very cautious in that four-leaf timing, not to roll too close to the one no timing, because we were seeing some damage um, up here. We are excited to announce that we got approved by RDAR to conduct rolling in cereals. We have adapted the study to include soft white wheat and barley to compare zero and full tillage practices. 
The trial will run at three sites in southern Alberta for three years. And this is a great opportunity to continue the research, um, adapt it, and, uh, and really look into, keep looking into the impact of rolling on our cereal crops. Yeah, so that's that. Um, I'd like to thank Alberta, or the Alfalfa Seed Commission, uh, Brad there, and Complete Agronomic Services, George Lubberts, for, for partnering with us on these trials. Um, it's been awesome to work with you guys. And Farming Smarter in general, uh, all the great staff, and, and everyone that's, that's made these trials successful as well. And thank you guys for listening to me, and I'll take any questions. I also want to thank the Wheat Commission as well. Yeah, well, with the RDAR approved study, uh, we have more partners with that one as well. So, great opportunity. There we go. Let's see if we've got some questions from our alfalfa seed growers or on the rolling barley. Anything? On the question front, you must have answered all their questions. Oh, we've got one at the back. Go ahead. So when you saw more bending and breaking in the alfalfa, do you think that that was due to the difference in weather from 2021 to 2020? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Sean. So the question was, um, it was with the rolling barley, I think you were getting that there, was um, did we see more bending and breaking of the plants and, and do we think that's due to the weather that we had in 2021? It's a possibility. Um, I mean, we, we definitely did see different growing conditions and, and responses from the crops. It seemed like that, that crop in, in particular was growing super fast through all its leaf stages and it just, it was growing so fast. And uh, so possibly with some of the, the heat stress and how it was growing, we could have had more damage because of those conditions. Um, yeah, it's hard to connect those dots specifically and, and to know exactly, but hopefully with the, the continued study with, through RDAR, maybe we can see some of those uh, events again and, and try to connect those dots. Another question up here. I know I missed you yesterday, so I noticed it this time. I was going to ask you, Trevor, is there any other control options for alfalfa needles? Like, is that a problem with alfalfa? Yeah, I was trying to ask Brad that too, you know, and I mean, I'm a little new to the alfalfa seed production, but um, from what I understand, there's not really many options. Um, there's, there's really no seed treatments. Um, they're going to last that long too, right? Alfalfa crops are growing for multiple years. Um, trap cropping, I haven't thought about that one, possibly. Um, yeah, I, I also kind of thought maybe like shorter rotations, changing things up a bit, but your neighbor down the road might have them as well. And so there's, there's a limited area to be growing the seed uh, crops. And those weevils can travel quite far. I think Brad was saying something like 18 kilometers. He's nodding, yeah. So like it's quite a distance that they can travel. So right now it's insecticides. The only weapon. We have one. one question over here, yeah. Um, from the desiccation trial, Regulon 90 is, was it Regulon Ion with surfactant already built in? Yes, we did use Regulon Ion with surfactant already built in. It was a little bit of an oversight on, on my part, but I mean, it still was a good test too, um, to see if that Regulon Ion without the surfactant is doing just as good as with surfactants, you know? And, we did find that it was doing just as good. And I think next year what we will use Reglone, just straight Reglone without the built-in surfactant. Uh, just normal label, label rate, I think it was like 5% volume by volume. 0.5, yeah. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Uh, let's put our hands together and thank Trevor. Thank you very much, Trevor, for sharing your research with us today.